The next guy up is Seth Sternberg. Um, I met Seth uh, a decade ago when he was just starting out with Mebo, and he eventually raised 70 million for the company, touched hundreds of millions of people with the Mebo consumer product that he did, and had a very successful exit to Google. And recently on a PowerPoint, he raised 20 million in the Series A from Mark Andreessen and others. And then he joined NFX, and he's a wonderful guy, and we're pleased to work with him. Thanks for coming, Seth. Thanks, dude. All right. <laughs> Uh, so first of all, Stan, Gigi, and James, thank you guys so much for having us and me. I really appreciate it. So um, Honor has been live in market serving seniors in the San Francisco Bay Area for 100 days. So I thought what I would do for, I said, seven minutes is just take you guys through a couple of lessons that we've learned, uh, particularly focused on network effects since we are here at NFX. So let's get at it. So first of all, why did I do Honor? I just want to make sure everybody knows what Honor is and, and why I decided to do it. So that's a picture of my mother visiting from Connecticut, joining, uh, kind of visiting our office at Honor. And I basically did Honor because of my mother. So I flew to Connecticut, which is where I'm from, and she picked me up at the airport at Bradley, if you guys know, Bradley Airport. And she, of course, picked me up in her car and she started driving me home. And as my mom was driving me home, I noticed she was driving slower than she used to drive. And my mother, like total lead foot, I mean, she literally got stopped by, you know, this airplane, you know, speed trap things when I was a kid. I remember that. And I was like, Mom, why are, why are you driving slower? And she said, oh, well, driving's a little bit harder than it used to be. And that was like a total freak out moment for me, because I was like, oh my god, wait a second, I live in California, she lives in Connecticut. And my mind kind of immediately went to, well, what happened here in my life? And this is me graduating from high school. And that's my grandmother. And that was about a year before my grandmother passed away. And you know, so this is like, this is like 20 years ago or something like that, right? Maybe a little bit longer. Um, and you know, a couple of things that stood out to me when my grandmother kind of got to the, near the end of her life is one was she was in her home in Great Neck, which is a four hour drive from West Hartford. And she came to visit us one day. And my mother knew my grandmother wasn't doing that well, but she came to visit us and she brought the, her brown paper bag of important things. And my mother looked in the brown paper bag, and one of the important things in that bag was the lid to a pot. And my mother said, you know, Mom, what, why, why is there a lid to a pot in this bag? And she said, well, these are my really important things. And that was a point at which we realized dementia had been setting in to my grandmother. And the thing is, is I, I said to my mother, I was like, Mom, if back then there were some way that you could have had someone visiting grandma, just going to her house, checking up on her, for an hour once a week, or you know, two hours every other week, making sure there wasn't mold on her food in the refrigerator, which happens a lot to seniors, or making sure that you could still reach her feet. Because if you can't reach your feet, then your toenails get too long. If your toenails get too long, you lose feeling in your feet. If you lose feeling in your feet, you're going to trip and fall. You might break your hip, and then you have a 50% chance of dying in the next six months. All right, so it's like, mom, like, wouldn't it be the reality, right? It's a reality business. So I was like, you know, mom, wouldn't that have been helpful? And she's like, yes, of course, but it didn't exist, right? So when I started looking at the world today, 20 years later after my grandmother passed on, and just like, you know, what will I do in five years when my mom needs help in Connecticut? The answer is we are still in the same really terrible state around how to care for our seniors as we were 20 years ago. Right? And so Honor was started with a mission to figure out how to help our parents age with joy, right? be happy, with comfort, right? be comfortable, and with grace, right? be meaningful to society right? as they age. And to, I never want to have to have the conversation with my mom, which is, hey, mom, I'm really sorry, but it's time for you to leave your home. So in 2014, 0.7% of VC funding went into products for the elderly. Now, that stat should strike you as kind of odd when you recognize that people over the age of 65 spend a trillion dollars a year in the United States alone, and we have an $18 trillion economy, right? So something's really kind of off kilter. We're not, like our, everybody sitting in this room, we're not investing enough into products and services for the elderly if I'm looking at the world 20 years later and nothing has changed, right? So I'm now gonna take you through a couple of lessons that I hope also kind of are proof points to all of you that you should take more time to look at products that could really benefit people who are 65 plus and probably in the process make the world a substantially better place. Okay, so 
Um, first one, really interesting as we've gotten into this market. So like I said, we've been live for 100 days, and Honor sends care professionals, right? So people who can help people with what are called activities of daily living. So things like getting out of bed, or getting food, right? Or even just you know, companionship, being with someone, right? Solving for isolation. We send those people into seniors' homes, because if you can't do activities of daily living by yourself, then you can't live in your own home any longer, right? So the only way to stay in your home is to have someone come in and help you with an activity of daily living. That's a $20 billion industry in America today, but it's just really, really broken. Now, as we've been you know, serving our first set of seniors and their families, because you really serve both, we've encountered something really fascinating. The needs of seniors are super heterogeneous from one senior to the next. Right? So like, David, your mom's needs and my mom's needs, or James, your mom's needs and my mom's needs, they're very, very different. Right? My mom might have diabetes, your mom might have dementia. Your mom might love cats. Well, you know what? We can't send a care professional to your mom's house who's allergic to cats, right? Because they're going to suffer. And maybe Stan's mom, you know, need, maybe she uh, speaks not English, maybe she speaks Russian, I don't know. But we might need a care professional who goes into your mom's house and speaks the appropriate language. Right? So seniors have these very heterogeneous needs. Now, interestingly, care professionals have very heterogeneous needs too, or sorry, very generous uh, heterogeneous capabilities. Right? So a care professional might speak a certain language, Mandarin, might have special training in dementia, might be allergic or not allergic to cats, and of course then you have the scheduled dimension. And so if you think about a chart, which is the, the quantity of supply, right? in our case, the quantity of care professionals, on the x-axis, and then user value on the y-axis. Right? Kind of as you move along this chart, when you have very heterogeneous, heterogeneous kind of needs and capabilities, you get an ever kind of increasing curve up and to the right. And that chart's really interesting, just I think in general, to analyze marketplaces-based businesses. Right? Because for almost every marketplace-based business, you can kind of draw a line. And I think for a lot of them, you'll actually find that the line kind of starts to go flat at some point, right? But when you have really heterogeneous needs and capabilities, I think the line keeps going up and to the right. And that's, that's the kind of business that I think keeps solving things and keeps making the world better as it grows bigger, certainly around providing much better care for seniors as they age. So second kind of interesting markets-based lesson as we've been rolling on or out. So the availability variable. Um, in today's world, if you want someone to come help your parents for one hour per day, you cannot get that service. It does not exist. Right? So you cannot call and say, hey, my mom just needs even one hour in the morning to get help getting out of bed and get food, and one hour in the evening to kind of help with you know, brushing her teeth and then like getting to bed. That's all my mom needs. You can't buy it because the existing kind of infrastructure, the existing agencies that do senior care cannot efficiently deliver you someone for just one hour at a time. The minimum is three hours. And I think that's terrible, A, because obviously there's a lot of demand for just one hour at a time, but B, you can make this service available to way more people from, an, from a socioeconomic perspective if you can figure out how to price and supply one hour efficiently, right? And so we launched One Hour Care right when we launched Honor. And it was pretty fascinating because right out the gate, we saw that, of course, a lot of people used it, but it really did expose us to a socioeconomic user that, you know, that is not typical of private duty home care. And we priced it the same way we priced you know, typical, our typical business, $25 an hour, um, and we were paying the care pros $17 an hour. Now, that was not closing. Right? So what we were finding is we kept having to have humans intervene to try to get like, CarePro to kind of control them to go to a senior's home and actually help that senior. And so we decided to let the marketplace do its thing and reprice supply and demand. Turns out there is an answer and you can deliver this service efficiently. It's $35 an hour. The, the elasticity on this for the users was literally zero. <laughs> like no one, when we went to the users and said, hey, instead of 25, it's now $35 an hour, no one churned. Zero, right? And at the same time, it turned out that care pros needed to get $30 in an hour in order to want to do a one-hour appointment, not 17. But all of a sudden, because of marketplace dynamics, right, we've enabled a whole new service, which actually counterintuitively makes the service available to people of lesser means, which I think is awesome, 
right, pays the care professionals more, which is fantastic, and fulfills a real big demand in society, right? So that was another really, I think, interesting marketplace kind of realization we had. Last one on, on kind of um, marketplace dynamics. So this is what everyone told me when I was working to launch Honor before we, before we launched. Everyone from the industry said caregivers, the care professionals who are paid, are completely untenable. They will go at AWOL, absent without leave. They'll show up late all the time. They'll say they're taking a gig and then not show, right? You will never be able to get the care professionals to actually reliably serve seniors. You're wasting your time, don't do this business. That's what everybody said. And then we interviewed a ton of the care pros, and this is actually one of our care pros. And you know, we, we, we asked them, you know, what's your life like? And one of the number one things that we heard back from the care pros is I want to be treated like the professional I am. Like I'm taking care of our seniors, I'm taking care of the elderly, treat me like a professional, not like a child. Today, I'm treated like a child. And so we enabled that with Honor, and this has been like a complete and total non-issue, right? Like the care pros show up on time, are incredibly reliable, they're awesome, right? And one amazing example that just kind of shows how far this goes, right? When you move from kind of fixed labor model really to a dynamic market labor model and then turn everybody into a professional. So we're onboarding our first batch of care pros, and we showed them the button in our app that they hit when they're sick. And the care pros, like I was, I was kind of watching this orientation, and the care pros went like crazy over the I'm sick button. And so I intervened and I said, hey, hey, wait, 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 why are you guys so unbelievably excited about the I'm sick button? Like, don't you normally just pick up the phone and call your agency and say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm sick? And the care pro said, no, actually, we're not allowed to be sick. And I was like, you're not allowed to be sick, but you're, you're humans, like, you get sick. And they said, yeah, but the agencies are too small, they can't backfill us, and the seniors don't live with their kids, so the kids can't work from home that day, so we still have to go help the seniors even though we're sick. I was like, so you're going to a senior's house who has a vulnerable immune system when you're sick to help them? And they're like, yes. Holy crap. But that's the world we live in today. And then I told the woman who runs caregiving at a major institution, but I'll leave her name out of it, their institution name out of it, and she said, oh yeah, my father got a, he got a lung infection from a sick care pro. Happens all the time. Holy crap. But, but with a dynamic kind of marketplace model, right, we just backfill immediately with the next best care pro to match that senior's very specific needs. So again, marketplace is making the world, I think, a fundamentally better place. Last point I'm gonna close on. Um, you know, everyone in here is kind of from the tech industry. And Honor's been super fascinating for me because um, we're fundamentally in the world of care. Like I'm going to the Stanford Longevity Conference right after I walk out of here and everybody's gonna be like a doctor or an academic. Um, and the people who run our care organization are from care, they're from labor, right? They're, they're political organizers. These people are amazing. But they're not, they're not the world that we all tend to live in. And the number one thing that I've learned is that for Honor, our technology, while like, I believe every company will be remade by technology, but we are, like technology is kind of our backbone, but we are a human service, right? Like 50% of the people who sign up for Honor directly are, seen, are the seniors themselves, not their kids, right? And how can it be, back to my original point on you know, why you guys should invest in this market, how can it be that the seniors themselves are proactively signing up for a tech service? Well, they're not, they're signing up for human service. And the point that I really wanna leave you all with, right, is this car. So people believe that innovation comes from technology. That's what probably everybody in this room believes. And you are all correct. I firmly believe that innovation comes from technology. But then I think a lot of people believe that technology and seniors don't mix. And so therefore you cannot invest in products for the elderly because it's too high risk that the elderly won't use that product because it's tech-based. I think that's an incorrect view of technology. A car is technology, right? It's just that in lots of seniors, as we know, drive cars and sometimes shouldn't be, right? But technology that's you know, designed super well feels like a human service and then you can get 50% of the people who are signing up for your service being the seniors themselves, and then 50% their kids doing it for them. So that is all I've got. Thank you guys very much for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs>